Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is really fun to keep seeing you each week and I hope you're enjoying it too. We've been loving the comments, um, chatting with you and getting to know each of you a little bit better. Um, I'm gonna leave my email down in the description box because I got a few emails this week and that was actually really fun. So um, just an update from last week, I did in fact leave Instagram the day that I posted my video. So it's been now one week since I've been on Instagram and I can't believe how much quieter just my mind is and how much I didn't realize that I was reaching for my phone in the mundane moments. Um, I would, before I had very strict boundaries, I thought that I was very careful um, not to be on it too much. And then when you take it away, then all of a sudden you realize how often you did just kind of reach for it. So off of Instagram, but I'll leave my email down below. Um, and one email that I got this week that I just wanted to talk about quickly is somebody asked, um, and this kind of leads into what we're going to talk about today. So someone asked, um, is margin a biblical idea? What about margin? Aren't we supposed to just kind of be working? Um, and I, I really appreciate this question. I think it's a great question. I've thought a lot about it over the years um, and have come to my own conclusions. I'll just share them with you and you are free to disagree with me. But um, so first of all, I come to this idea as someone who has lots of ideas in her head and her physical body doesn't always keep up with the ideas that she wants to do. So I'm very much of an idealist, have lots of ideas, lots of hopes, lots of dreams, and my body says no. Um, I have lived with lupus now for over 12, 13 years that I know of, um, and managing that uh, forces me to have to create margin in my life. Um, and through that experience um, of realizing that I, my identity in Christ has nothing to do with my productivity. And I, this person wasn't saying that they felt like their identity was wrapped up in their productivity. But I would say, you know, if we look at the account of creation, God worked for six days and then he gave us the Sabbath. He rested on the seventh day. He gave it to us in the seven, in the seven, in the 10 commandments. And then also, if you look at Jesus's life, um, how he lived and worked and ministered um, and lived as a human in a human body with so much need and so much to do, um, we see him taking space um, for rest or to be with his small group of people. He wasn't out healing, you know, at 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30, 10, 10.30. Um, he had space in his days to eat and fellowship and be with his people. And of course, like in the, in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, like he went to get away and yet people still came and he still ministered to the people, even though he was going to rest. So there are times when we just push through, but he also gave us this beautiful picture of margin in our lives. And, um, I always have to remember that he is a kind and good shepherd and that he, that God created us in these frail human bodies. And, um, a couple other illustrations are just kind of on a practical note. Um, although I'm not Catholic, I do greatly respect, um, mother Teresa. And several years ago I saw, you know, you think of her, um, helping the poor, living amongst the poor, serving, um, and just giving herself away, which she absolutely did. Um, I'll see if I can find it, but if I, if I do find her daily schedule, I'll link it down below. Um, but I remember looking at it and it had times for prayer and Bible reading and then a time for ministry and then a time to come back and eat and then a time for a nap and a rest. And then, you know, just this very simple rhythm of giving yourself away and then coming back and recharging, giving yourself away and coming back and recharging. And um, that is very much how I want to live my life and also kind of how I'm forced to live my life just um, by the nature of my energy levels. Uh, and so 
Uh, and I think too, as a mom, you know, I've been a mom now for almost 23 years. And uh, I would say the best times of discipleship and relationship building and um, just heart connection would be in the margins. I, I find that when we're rushing, I think I said this last week, when we're rushing, rushing, rushing everywhere, it's hard to really connect with people. It's hard to have those moments of just sometimes boredom or sometimes just good conversation together. And um, I think God created us for community and for rest and for beauty and truth and goodness and for all of those things to seep in. Um, we have to be still sometimes. And so I think productivity is great and lovely. And I think there is a very much a case for being slow and simple um, in our rhythms in our life. So that's just my take on it. And also uh, one more thing. I think that, you know, God created this nature, this beautiful nature for us to go in and, and be in and be restored. And if you, I'm kind of a... Uh, science nerd in this space of like, I want more Christians to write about this topic because the science out there is so incredible what nature actually does for our bodies, for our lymphatic system, for our parasympathetic nervous system, for our, you know, our all kinds of things um, that nature does for us, seeing it, having the sun, you know, uh, on our faces and in our eyes and um, just all the ways that nature um, restores our soul. Just like in Psalm 23, um, you know, he leads us beside quiet waters. And, and they say in a book I was reading, it was like, you know, um, hearing bird song, the rustling of leaves, looking at trees swaying and some sort of running water are the three things that your body needs to recharge. And I don't think that you can experience those things as you're hurriedly walking past them. I think it's something that you have to experience. And, and Psalm 23 gives us a beautiful picture of that. So now that this has gone on very long, you know, I'm not even going to try to fit this all in quickly. You're just going to have to be with me. Pretend this is a podcast. Turn it on while you are washing your dishes and let's just chat. So all of that to say that the topic that I wanted to talk about today and what I'm going to talk about at the end of every month, um, I'm a day late today, but the end of every month, I want to share with you what I've read last month and then share with you or challenge you to join me for what I'm reading this coming month. And I'm going to give you the categories that I try to pick from. But then first of all, I just want to offer you an idea of why I think that reading is important. I talked last week about my Bible reading. Of course, that is first and foremost, my time of Bible reading, my time of prayer, my time of biblical meditation. Um, those things are first in my day. And then I read a little bit in the morning. I read a little bit in the afternoon. I read a little bit in the evening. Um, and then in snatches as I'm stuck in traffic or waiting at an you know, orthodontist appointment or those kind of things. And so reading kind of fills in the cracks. And especially now that I'm off of Instagram, I'm finding way more time to read. But even still, I think that reading is such a gift um, to our hearts and our souls. And I think the written word is such a blessing and it can be such a way to experience the world on this grand scale and see goodness and truth and beauty, which is all what God created for us in the midst of a great story. And um, I don't know if you have heard of Tish Oxenreiter. You probably have because she's really amazing. Um, and she writes and um, has written several books, one of which, by the way, um, is called At Home in the World. And her and her family took a tour around the world for a year and they came and stayed with us and so if you read the chapter about uganda you will find us because um they they were here for three or four days and um that was a while back but so uh tish and her family have been here to our home in uganda and that was really really fun um and we've seen each other a couple other times at speaking at different conferences and so um, she writes um, a blog, I guess you would call it, on Substack, and she was writing a couple weeks ago just about um, we become what we love, we become what we gaze at, 
which I've held this idea for such a long time, but specifically she was talking um, in the area of books and, and just how um, good ideas and good books um, feed our souls and shape us um, into the people that we become. She said, we need a steady idea of good ideas found in good books. And so I would argue that, you know, a silly romance novel might not be the best way to fill our minds. So it is important what we pick um, to read, but then also um, to actually read. And I think um, people would say, oh, I just don't have time. I can't fit it in. And I would say, even if you can only read five minutes a day, um, I think you can actually fit it in. If if you like to listen to audiobooks, audiobooks are a great way to fit some books in. Um, I, I don't like to listen to audiobooks. I like to read the actual book, but I just carry my Kindle with me everywhere I go. And anytime there's a space, I just grab it and start reading. Um, and so truth, goodness, and beauty um, in the written word to me is such a gift. And it is the epitome of living a simple life, a slow life of where it's such so luxurious to just get lost in a book for five or 10 minutes or an hour if you have it. Um, on Sunday afternoons, I take a nap every day, but on Sunday afternoons, I make it a longer nap. And that is when I do a lot of my reading until I fall asleep and then have a short nap. And then sometimes when I get up, the kids will be playing with my husband if he's here um, outside and then I just sit and read outside for the rest of the afternoon. So um, first of all, so yeah, so I think, you know, some of my favorite people came, have come to me. Some of my great heroines or heroes have um, shown me different things about um, different aspects of the gospel and different aspects of God and his truth um, through the books that I've read, um, specifically fiction, um, I, which might feel strange to some people that this isn't truth. How can this be something that is uplifting or pointing you to the Lord? I would just say like um, the character of Levin and Anna Karenina was a beautiful picture of goodness and truth and beauty and God pursuing someone and then um, coming to faith and in just a beautiful way. Um, my favorite book of all time is Jane Eyre. Uh, I think I find Jane so compelling because, um, as Heidi White would say from the Close Reads podcast, the duty versus desire um, is uh, this deep um, tension in our lives, and and Jane chooses the the to do this duty over what she wants in the moment, and um, it's there's so many metaphors and just so such a beautiful picture of the gospel in Jane Eyre. Um, if you haven't read it, please read it because it's my favorite. Um, maybe we'll read it together this year because I am planning to read it again because I read it every year. Also, The Count of Monte Cristo. What a beautiful story of thinking, you know, that you want uh, revenge and then finding redemption. Um, and it's just so fraught with uh, the gospel in that book as well. Um, Agnes and David Copperfield, a beautiful picture of truth and, and just what it means to love others and, and love the Lord. Um, and then of course in, uh, you've got like the whole genre of like missionary biographies or just biographies in general. I think I've learned so much. Of course, my early days of my life were, were shaped by Elizabeth Elliot and, and Jim Elliot. Um, the stories that I read about them um, impacted my life in huge ways, which is a whole nother uh, topic. Uh, you know, and then Darlene uh, Dibler Rose in Evidence Not Seen, Betsy um, Ten Boom in The Hiding Place. Um, so many of these people, um, and their lives, the way that they lived out their faith, they're so compelling. And then, of course, you've got theology and practical Christian living, which is just, you know, a huge genre that you could lose yourself in till the end of time. You know, Tozer and 
Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and all of the, the great books um, and new ones as well that are come you know that are coming out that are really really lovely like gentle and lowly from dane ortland um and so for me what i try to read every month is a like picking from four genres so first of all fiction something that is holy and lovely not holy but lovely and um beautiful writing uh, not always sometimes i like a good agatha christie mystery but there's always uh like a overarching theme of goodness um and then the second genre would be spiritual formation or theology like those kind of things um like the tozers and c.s lewis Jerry Bridges, all of those. And then the third one would be like Christian biography. Um, I don't really read that many like non-Christian biographies. So maybe like some memoirs and things like that. And then um, the fourth genre would be like learning, homeschooling, nature. I love nature, anything about a nature, you know, for nature for children, nature for adults, the healing powers of nature, um, practical helps, which I'll share with you in a minute. I had one of those this, this month. So looking back of, from January, the books that I read, um, and I will list these below and I don't use affiliate links, so, but I will link them so you can click on them. So A Still and Quiet Mind by Esther Smith was incredible. Um, such a good book about biblical meditation about taking your thoughts captive but not just in a like directive kind of a way of walking alongside you and uh, exploring how to really do that on a practical level very biblically sound and I really enjoyed it um second was becoming Elizabeth Elliot which even though I absolutely love Elizabeth Elliot I didn't love that one um the reason that I didn't love it is that I don't know the the biographer Ellen Vaughn Sorry, Ellen, but I did not like her voice being constantly poked into the story. I felt like um, there's other biographers that I think do a better job of telling you the story as like a feast. They're putting it out for you, but they don't insert themselves into it. And so sometimes I just felt like, oh, I didn't want to know what Ellen thought. I just wanted to read about Elizabeth Elliot. So there's that. I still greatly enjoyed the book, to be honest. I mean, I didn't love the writing, but I loved the stories, the pieces that I got, particularly as a missionary, loved to see like some more real ugly bits of real life on the mission field, discouragements, um, you know, everything isn't this hilltop experience and just some of the lows that Elizabeth had, particularly after her husband was martyred. Number three, Sleep Smarter, um, a book just about the practical ways that you can improve your sleep. I thought the book was way too long. <laughs> the book had really good ideas, a, a lot of them, but I felt like I don't need a whole chapter telling me all about the why of it. Like, give me some science, but I don't need, I don't need all of it. So just tell me what to do, basically. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that makes me lazy. I'm not sure. The fourth one was Disciplines of a Godly Woman by Barbara Hughes. I have read that before. It was a great book. Um, just a very practical book. I will say, yeah, so I think it was written in the 1990s or maybe the early 2000s. I felt like some of the illustrations were a little bit trite and I just, it, the, the ideas were really good. I didn't love the examples in the book. Number five, I read David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Absolutely loved it. It took me almost a whole month to read it. Um, and it just is a sweeping tale of David Copperfield's life and all the amazing and interesting and crazy people that he meets in his life. I highly recommend it. Um, yes. And then um, I'm not sure how to say it, but Piranesi, Piranesi. I'm not, I just finished it. I read it in two days and I'm still thinking about it. So I'm not quite ready to talk about it yet, but it was recommended from Sarah Clarkson. If you are familiar with her, um, 
she has kind of a book club once a month and that was the January pick. So once I had finished David Copperfield, I read it. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating book and I've got a lot to think about and some things that are still just kind of like rolling around in my mind about it. It's a very interesting book. I will say there are some bad words and some a couple of themes that I wasn't thrilled with, but the book was amazing and confusing, <laughs> but in a good way. And then the, four, uh, the seventh book that I read was The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. And I thought that it would be very simple that I would, you know, it's a short book and I thought, oh, it's very easy. I'll just get through that in a couple of days. Um, it took all of my strength to read it and read it well. Um, his ideas are incredible and it's amazing to see that he wrote this in the 1940s and how true, like it was as though he predicted what was going to happen, as particularly in the U.S., just as we take away ideas and the heart and soul of education and then what it gets replaced with and then the end result is pretty much how we're living now in the world. So those are the seven books that I read for January. So if you're still here with me, God bless you. But um, I want to offer you uh, a challenge of what I'm going to read for this upcoming month, uh, the month of February. And I would love for you to join me uh, for these books. I'm going to have four books in four genres and then we can discuss them at the end of the month. So the first book I want us all to read is uh, Hannah Coulter by Wendell Berry. It is a lovely book. It is hauntingly beautiful and I'm kind of nervous to reread it in a way because it brings up so many like deep emotions in me, to be honest. So yeah, so I'm gonna read Hannah Coulter by Wendell Berry um, for spiritual formation. Um, these are all books, not all of them. Some of them I've read already, but Liturgy of the Ordinary. Um, I can't remember her name off. I'll have it in the description box. Liturgy of the Ordinary. Now I will say I don't agree with her theology on everything. Um, and we have, we have come from kind of different faith traditions. However, the book is lovely. There's nothing heretical in it. Uh, and it's, beautifully written and helps you really think about how to bring the ordinary into the the sacred or to worship the Lord in all things just kind of like brother Lawrence's practice of the presence of God but in a very modern simple way for our everyday lives so that's number two number three for my learning education, I'm going to be reading Modern Miss Mason by Leah Bowden. I love homeschooling. I love Charlotte Mason homeschooling. And so if that's something that interests you, please join me for that read. And then the last one, kind of theology um, sorts of things, I will be reading Praying the Bible by, I think it's Donald Whitney. Um, again, I'll put it in the description box. But uh, those are the four books that I'm going to be reading. Uh, if you want to pick one of them and join me, if you want to pick all of them and join me, uh, or if you would like to pick your own books from those genres and let me know in the comments. Um, and so January was my birthday month. I turned 46 and for my birthday, I took three friends out and I asked them some questions um, about you know, what did God teach them in 2022? What were they hoping that God was going to do? what were they trusting him for in 2023? And then the, uh, the last question, which I ask everyone was like, what was your favorite book of 2022? And what are you most looking forward to reading in 2023? So since it was my birthday, can you leave me a comment and tell me what your favorite book, maybe your favorite book of all time, if you want to, your favorite book of 2022, and what you're looking forward to reading in 2023? That would be such a gift. And I, I think it would be fun because then we can all see what each other, um, enjoys reading and get, I love getting book ideas. So, um, thank you for that ahead of time. And I will leave all this information in the description box and I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. I will see you next week. Um, we'll be back to talking about simplicity 
and contentment and what that looks like in our everyday lives. And until then, I will see you later and go get a book. Okay, bye.